Significant numbers of scientists doubt Darwin on Darwin Day, next on Campus Roundup. Hello, I'm Dr. Duke, and this is the Campus Roundup at the College Fix. This week, we are going to discuss the descent from Darwinism in the scientific community. To talk more about this, we welcome Brittany Slaughter, a student at Liberty University and a journalist for the College Fix. Uh, Brittany, welcome to the show today. Thank you for having me. Well, give us the uh, inspiration for the College Fix assigning you this article. What made this happen? Right, so tomorrow is actually Darwin Day. So it's a day where scientists celebrate Darwinism and the theory of evolution. So we thought it would be interesting to write an article about the list of about a thousand scientists, actually topped a thousand now, who have decided that they don't believe that Darwin's theories are completely accurate. Some of them don't believe it at all, or they have serious doubts about his beliefs. What I love about the article is you point out that these scientists are skeptical. And we know that science and skepticism have to go hand in hand. If we have scientists who are not skeptical, even of the things they think they most know, it really is going to continue to give a one-sided view of science. Now, these, these professors, they're all over the country. Give me a, a sense of the scope and the diversity of the professors who have signed this document. Absolutely. There are scientists in London, Australia. They're all over the world. That, that have doubts about Darwin's ideas. They're uh, mathematicians, they're scientists, they're biology professors, chairs of departments. It's a very, very broad scope, but it shows the, the diversity and just how uh, serious this problem is that people don't, people with such um, high standards and high academics don't, don't believe in Darwin's theories. What are the primary aspects that these scientists are, are skeptical of? One person that um, he pointed me to his website said that they really couldn't observe a cell um, accurately because they didn't have advanced microscopes like we have today. And, you know, cells make up everything. And so if you can't observe the very basic unit of what makes us human, of what makes things um, how they are, you really can't have a foundation for making a claim such as Darwin's theory. How many people did you reach out to in writing this, uh, this article? I reached out to about, it was about 15 to 17. And I only heard back from a few. Um, one person I called actually hung up on me <laughs> after I introduced myself. Um, but not many responded. I don't know if they just were super busy or if they just don't like talking to the media, but the people that did respond, they were very helpful, very kind, um, very excited to talk about their ideas. It's interesting that there were a lot of scientists who signed this statement questioning Dar Darwin's work who still wouldn't want to talk to you. That was very interesting. And I know that, um, uh, that when looking at your wall there, you got that wonderful statement on the wall to the, to the right of you, seek truth. Uh, that seems to be where we ought to be with science, right? That um, sometimes scientific truths are going to take us in places we don't want to go. Sometimes scientific truth is going to make us question, as we continue to evolve as scientists, what we already know. It seems to me that there is a resistance. Once an idea gains cachet, once an idea, uh, a scientific idea or a theory becomes popular, people, including scientists, really don't want to let that go. Uh, and I think, you know, not just uh, the Darwinian question, but also uh, global warming. I mean, we, it, we have a number of scientists who have also signed on to suggest that they have doubts about that. But boy, are they maligned uh, by their fellow scientists. And I know uh, from your article that some of the scientists who signed on to this statement against uh, questioning some of Darwin's legitimacy, they have been attacked too. Do you know in what ways they've been attacked? Absolutely. Some of them have been attacked um, just online. And some of their peers think that, you know, one person said that you, you really don't have knowledge that n no sound mind person would sign such a list. And it's really crazy that, you know, we live in such a world that you can't challenge an idea without being attacked, without having names thrown at you or having your knowledge and your academia um, questioned, just because you, you dare to say that this guy many years ago may be wrong. And as we know, Darwin himself, before he died, said that his theory could be wrong. And so to have these scientists come out and say, look, we're, we're very knowledgeable on the topic, you know, science is our life, but we just want to point out some flaws, we want to ask some questions, further this, and see if there really is um, a chance that Darwin was wrong. But to have all these other people say, how dare you? You know, they can't accept, they can't accept diversity of thought, it seems. Yeah, and a lack of diversity of thought in the sciences means you're going to get a prepackaged science, isn't it? I mean, if we assume that uh, uh, Charles Darwin, who was working well over 100 years ago, 150 years ago, if we're going to assume that everything he said back then, without the benefit of all of the scientific technology we have today, and we're going to assume it's true and then try to build knowledge off of that exclusively, man, that's going to take us down some dark alleys. And we see this again, I mentioned with the climate change debate, it, this idea that we are frustrating uh, uh, professors and scientists who want to consider this. If, I, if it were me, 
I would absolutely, as a scientist, if I were a scientist, I would want the people who disagree with me to throw their best possible scientific shot at me so that we could compare notes. Why is this seems like such a difficult thing for so many? Absolutely. It's possible that they actually don't have good arguments to, to fight against, but it just seems that they're afraid. You know, people get so comfortable in what they believe that when someone offers an alternative view, they're, they're totally afraid. They don't want to um, face it. They don't want to listen to it because what if they're wrong? And then this thing that they've based their life around that they've believed for so long, then their, their foundation is shattered. And it doesn't matter if when it's shattered, it could be something better behind it. They, they don't want to be wrong. They don't want to have the status quo challenge. They don't want to have what they're comfortable with be taken away. Brittany Slaughter, thanks for your time today. Keep up the great work, and I hope I see you again soon. All right, now time to shift to Talking Campus, our weekly discussion with members of the College Fix editorial team. Today I'm joined by College Fix editor Jennifer Cabani to, to continue this conversation about the descent from Darwinism in the scientific community. Talk a little bit about Mr. Darwin. I mean, obviously, like a figure like Newton, a figure like uh, Freud, somebody really just terribly important. But why is it so difficult in the scientific community to perhaps suggest that maybe what he was doing in the 1850s, with all the new technology and information we have, it might not be the only way to view things? Well, exactly. He had his theory. It's still a theory. He came up with it in the 1800s. It is now 2019, and we have the electron micro microscope. We have the Hubble telescope. We have, um, you know, things that can split particles, and we've seen further into the cell and to the atom than we ever could have dreamed possible. And what we're finding is it's incredibly complex. They're like little machines. They're like microprocessors. The human body is like an organic computer. And the scientists are saying, yeah, there's no way that natural selection and random mutation can account for uh, this type of complexity and in information. It's just implausible uh, at best and impossible as well. We take Darwin as an expert to question Darwin now is a kind of heresy. We see that in the global warming movement. What Al, Go Al Gore said a couple of weeks ago, a couple months ago, that people who disagree with climate change should be imprisoned for that opinion. And you see how dangerous this gets quickly. Well, science is based on something that's observable and repeatable. And what these scientists that signed the dissent document are saying is, you know, we're, we're not finding anything to back up this theory, or at least it deserves some serious scrutiny. And that's a simple statement. It's a worthwhile statement for a scientist to make because isn't science completely based on, you know, ex experimentation and, and looking into things. So, you know, they have been looking into things for, for the, la the last century since Darwin came up with this idea. And what they're finding is the complexity of all living things is so astronomically amazing that they just can't use natural selection and, and random mutation to account for it. I mean, remember, uh, mutation is a loss of information. They don't observe mutations adding information. So, um, you know, but your DNA, the human DNA, each cell has six feet of DNA in it. Did you know if you stretched out all the DNA in the human body, it could reach to the sun and back 61 times? That's how much information you have in your body. And these scientists are saying, hey, wait a minute, you can't explain this much information uh, with random mutations and natural selection. You, you just can't. So they have a legitimate uh, question on their hands and it deserves to be heard. But of course, um, as you mentioned, it's a heresy to even say so. And uh, evolution is taught as fact in so many of our textbooks today. Well, David Berlinski, the great mathematician and argue, guy who spent a lot of time arguing Christopher Hitchens about God when he was still alive, he, made the, he was once asked about this. Why did Darwinian theory so sweep the sciences that no one can even question it anymore? And he said, and I quote Berlinski, said, it's because the Darwinian theory gave scientists an explanation for the creation and origin of the universe that had nothing to do with God that was able to completely freeze God out. I know you've done a lot of work with intelligent design, and I also know that, that not every scientist who is dissenting from Darwin Day believes in intelligent design, but talk about intelligent design as an alternative to this way of seeing things. Well, essentially, intelligent, the des intelligent design community, and they're made up of a whole wide array of scientists, you know, biologists, uh, chemists, phys physicists, and including um, computer scientists, uh, they all understand that information cannot spontaneously come into existence. Information must 
come from a mind. So where did that information come from? You know, I just mentioned we can stretch our DNA uh, in the human body. If we stretched it out, it could reach the sun and back 61 times. That's a lot of information. And so they're questioning um, how that could have come about from nothing. And um, it's a growing field. And one of the arguments that uh, a gentleman we quote in the article uh, makes is that that what we're seeing is more complex than any computer that we have. So if if the, if our cells are more complex than the computers we've created, how do you account for that? How do you explain that? So the intelligent design movement, it doesn't um, endorse any one particular religion at all. It's just a bunch of scientists saying, hey, this deserves some exploration. Uh, you know, we, we want answers that make sense and not blindly um, throw our faith behind uh, what's called a Darwinian orthodoxy, essentially. I've heard some people say uh, that it takes more faith to be an atheist, actually, than somebody who says, hey, look, there's some intelligent design um, uh, examples that we're seeing around here. We should look into it further. It's actually uh, takes less faith to see the design all around us than it does to stringently hold fast to the idea of Darwinian evolution. Yeah, I think it's not just a, a scientific skepticism, it's math and statistics, right? What statistically would have to happen? What are the odds that complex forms of life could uh, grow and thrive in, in perhaps this is the only planet in the whole universe where that may be the case? Statistically, it just seems like uh, a much more of a leap of faith to believe it all ha happened as one big ra random accident than that there was anything behind it. Uh, last question I wanna ask you to follow up on a little bit because we talked about this in the first segment, but I wanna follow up a little bit in the sense that is it possible that there are those apparatuses in the scientific community who are much more unwilling to concede God or any kind of intelligence uh, than they are to uh, commit to the idea that science should be open to pursue those things anywhere they lead them? I feel sometimes that um, atheist scientists who want to shut down any debate on this matter, um, it's almost a dogma to them. It seems like it's almost a religious uh, fervent belief to them that they won't even allow this debate that is quote unquote settled science. And it's really unfortunate because science is based on, um, you know, the search for discovery, the search for exploration, a passion for finding out how things work. And yet it sort of stymies all of that uh, exploration and experiments when you're not even allowed to look at the discoveries that we've found in the last couple of years, thanks to advances in technology and go, wait, what does that tell us about the makeup of the universe and the makeup of the human body? So, um, you know, they, they like to belittle, you know, religious folk, but yet they act just like them. Yeah, that's the key word. I love the word that you use, the word dogma. Dogma tends to shut down and shut out. And, the, and while I can understand why dogma occupies certain human religions, uh, the last place I want dogma is in my science. That, that, that seems like something we all can agree on, I think. Absolutely. Pope John Paul II once famously observed that re religion and faith can never ever be opposed to each other because they both stem epistemologically from the same God. But as time has gone on since the days of John Paul, we begin to recognize a few things that very uncomfortably, science is becoming a little bit religious. Uh, and I'm not necessarily talking about the scientists working in labs or laboring uh, in their experiments. I'm talking about the way the culture is treating science. We, it's obvious to point out that uh, what global warming means to a scientist and what it means to the English professor or the history professor, the philosophy professor, who's forced to teach it on the college campus, they're very different things. Science is about skepticism. You cannot have science without the skeptical. The degree to which we're starting to hear more and more from scientific arenas, that consensus is enough for science, it never is and it never will be. And what happens when we begin to believe the phrase, science says, we take that as almost a dogmatic religious statement. When scientists speak, there can be no dissent, there can be no disagreement, there can be no follow-up experiments to try to justify this. That's a dangerous game. Uh, it seems to me that we've come a long way since the days when Christian churches were so orthodox and dogmatic that people who disagreed were rounded up and burnt as heretics. It's odd to see now that the religious side of our equation in culture seems a little bit more open to, com to communication and work across borders. But, but rat more radical aspects of the scientific community are starting to deny the possibility. Yeah, I mean, even somebody like Al Gore, who's never been a scientist and has no scientific training, actually said a few years ago that we need to arrest, imprison people who doubt global warming or challenge Darwinian theory. 
the thing is, is that as long as things are theoretical, uh, Darwin, uh, global warming, climate change, we need a healthy, healthy, healthy set of research that is trying to debunk it because that's going to make those who want to prove it much more careful and much stronger. Science works best when we're not just trying to prove a, for, uh, a forehand assumption, but trying to tear apart uh, our experiments and our opinions to make sure that they stand the rigorous test of science and skepticism. And that's the final fix. Be sure to stay up on all the latest news and information from the College Fix by joining us on all of our social media platforms. For the Campus Roundup, I'm Dr. Duke, and we'll see you next time.